Hey there, and welcome to A Little Market Insight. I'm your host, Justin Little, and I'm absolutely delighted to have you join me for an exciting journey into the captivating world of real estate. Whether you're a seasoned real estate investor or someone taking the first steps into the property ladder, my mission is to provide you with the tools and knowledge that you need to make informed decisions. Today, I'm on the road with Stuart Websdale from A Buyer's Choice Home Inspection, where we'll be learning all about home inspections. We'll also be sitting down with Anthony Pizzuti, Senior Manager, Assurance and Accounting of MNP, to talk about capital gains, tax write-offs, and estate planning in regards to property. But first, I'm joined by Igor Lukacs of Kingswood Engineers to discuss creating open concept living in your home. Igor, thanks so much for joining me today. I am ecstatic. Today. I appreciate it. It's a good outfit choice. Real <laughs> little matchy, uh, matchy, matchy today. Almost I got the, email. the white shirt too. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, I know one of the biggest things that you probably run into is removing walls, making that own open concept living. And that's really something that you need an engineer for. So let's start off with a basic question. How do you know um, if it's safe to remove a wall or not? Good question. Uh, the first the first thing that we look for is what's the age of the home. So whether it's a 100-year-old Hamilton home or one of those bungalows from the 1960s mm-hmm. or a new build from 90s onward, um, from there, you, you have a really good idea of what's actually load-bearing. So the older homes, the Hamilton uh, wood-framed homes, uh, pretty much every wall is load-bearing. So we often get people that want to take out that wall between the kitchen and the living room. Mm-hmm. Always load-bearing. Always, eh? Always. In the bungalows from the 60s and 70s, that center wall that lines up with the beam in the basement, you can be pretty sure that's load-bearing. And then the walls... Uh, running perpendicular to that are not. In the newer homes, after computer-aided design started to become popular, um, they started to do funky stuff where they'd hide beams. So it, it could be anywhere? So you, it's really hard to know. Yeah. Typically, it's, it's that very wall that people want to remove, kitchen and living room, to open up that space. That one is typically load-bearing, but oftentimes they throw in additional steel beams inside the ceilings. Um, so anytime it's a home newer than 1990, let's say, when they started to build them uh, with computers, then... But then when it comes to removing this wall, like what sort of modifications are needed? Say the wall is load-bearing, like you found out that it is load-bearing. What is the process to now open that? Yeah, great question. Uh, the first step is always to bring in a qualified engineer. Um, we come in and we assess what is actually being held up by that wall. So that's super important. Oftentimes people forget that um, maybe roof loads or snow loads can be part of that design, which has a huge impact on the beam size. Um, So number one, we look at what are all the loads that are falling on that wall, whether it's just attic space or is it bedrooms, is it roof space, sometimes it's even additional beams falling on that support wall. Once we have that, Also a super important component is to look at how are we gonna transfer that load down to the foundations. So ideally when we're doing a wall removal, uh, we wanna focus on sending the new loads down to the exterior foundations because then we don't have to do a lot of additional foundation work. If the beam ends for whatever reason in the middle of the home, then we also have to check the steel beams in the basement to make sure they have enough capacity. And if they don't, where do we need to put a new footing in the basement to make sure it's gonna be okay? So I, I, I think the most contractors have a good understanding of the, where a beam is needed. Mm-hmm. Um, often we find that what's missed is the foundation consideration. Mm-hmm. So that, that's a really important point. Yeah, that is for sure. And then in terms of cost, when it comes to doing this, I know obviously depending what you're doing, yeah. the costs are going to be different. But let's say uh, for the average homeowner that has one of those 60s bungalows on one of the East streets, because yeah. uh, yeah. those I see are probably one of the most common ones that get opened up. What would the general cost be to remove a wall like that, like that kitchen living room wall? Yeah, so for that project, and those homes really are in need of modernization besides opening that up, you know, the closet space, yeah. I, I think, is the next most popular <laughs> uh, issue. Yeah, but closet. in terms of, let's say we're talking about a Hamilton bungalow where it's got the living room, a little corner dining room, and then that kitchen that's boxed out. Um, it's not a huge span, so there's two options. One, we do a post in the middle, 
and kind of integrate it into a new island um, and then use two beams. Or we're doing a full span, um, which is a bit larger. So this, the distinction there is typically if we're doing a post and we're spreading it over two beams, that four ply uh, wooden beam in the basement often has enough capacity. So we don't have to worry about any foundation upgrades. Okay. Um, if we're going to span the full 20 feet, the full 25 feet to open that space up entirely, um, then in the center of the home where all of that load gets transferred, uh, we do want to be careful about uh, foundation work. So ballpark figures in terms of getting a building permit done, two to three grand about there. Permit fees from the city ends up being about three to five hundred dollars. Contractors, I don't like to speak for contractors because <laughs> they want to come out, they want to quote it. Yeah. Um, but a typical, let's say an LVL beam or a wood engineered wood beam mm -hmm. that's 15 feet long and it's just holding up attic space, we're looking in the five grand mark uh, for them to come do the demo to set up their temporary support walls. Always important to get your temporary supports up. Mm -hmm. um, and then for them to install the beam. So I think five grand is the opening figure. If it gets longer, more complex, uh, if you want to do steel to get a flush ceiling, um, then it shoots up to 10 grand. Um, in the newer homes, when we're talking about replacing several steel beams with reinforced steel beams and a flush ceiling, um, then it ends up being 15 to 25 grand for two, three beams. Okay. That's you, the general. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, those are great quotes. And you yeah. touched on the one thing that's important is permits. Yeah. <laughs> permits, permits. I know a lot of times, unfortunately, people do this project yeah. without it, but it's important to go through that process. So it's good to incorporate that cost as well. And then when you're taking these walls down, um, what are some of the common challenges that you'd say you run into? I would say the biggest challenges, aside from figuring out if the foundations are going to be okay or not, um, the items that we don't consider often especially when we're talking about 1980s, 1990s, that madame style of home, mm. um, that center wall dividing the kitchen and the living room is their favorite wall to put in your uh, plumbing for upstairs and your HVAC for upstairs. So essentially you're not allowed to put into the exterior walls plumbing and HVAC because it takes away from the insulation. So they were left with a few options. Either you're doing bulkheads mm -hmm. on the sides or you're using that cherished wall for all of your plumbing, all of your HVAC. So that ends up being a, a bigger challenge than, let's say, swapping out the beam. How do you relocate the plumbing? Because yeah. water needs to flow only one way. Yeah. So you can't do some funky stuff. Um, HVAC design, although it is there and it's a consideration, typically you can reroute it to the exterior, so sometimes we're doing a dummy wall to put all of that uh, HVAC in. Um, you lose a little bit of space, but you get an open uh, concept kitchen. Um, those are the two main challenges that, that we see. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine for sure. And then uh, when it comes to timeline on doing something like this, like what should somebody expect for the process? Timelines, for whatever reason, always are much longer than you'd expect. I think it has something to do with, this is essentially all custom work, right? It's not a production. You're not doing the same project. Every project has its own challenges. So what ends up happening is um, we get brought in. We need about two, three weeks to do our engineering design, uh, do the drawings. Um, then what we typically do is we give that design to the uh, client to um, discuss with the contractor. Once that's done, then they submit for permit, or we can do it on their behalf. Um, and then the city can take, they're supposed to take 10 days, but it's 10 to 30 okay. is the general. Contractors actually doing the work, not super um, time consuming, but it's getting the contractor lined up. That, to do it. that eats up yeah. most time. So contractors can do this kind of simple project, let's say five days for the framing, but getting them lined up materials and all that ends up being much much longer so perfect two months yeah two months there you go all right well thanks so much you i really appreciate you joining us today uh, up next i'm on location with stuart websdale from a buyer's choice home inspections